Hello. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we will start the second part of our program. You can come in front, no need to feel shy. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Prof. Sangun Jung, who's already been introduced today morning. He's also the president of the AACVTS. So he's got to rush off to a board meeting, so he's going to give his talk first while I give mine the second one. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, members and guests. Given topic to me is the prediction of recurrence and the surgical management of the <coughs> stage 3A and 2 disease. <coughs> as you know, the N2 disease is uh, understood as the locally advanced occult systemic metastasis. So, lymph node metastasis is a very key point for expecting recurrence and uh, surgical outcome, treatment outcome. So control not only for local, but also possible uh, distant micrometastasis is very important. So we need a multimodal approach to this specific disease population. So N2 situation is very heterogeneous. So 3A1, 3A2, 3A1 is the detected by pathological examination uh, after surgery, and uh, A2 is the, uh, diagnosed during surgery like a frozen biopsy. This is clinically occult N2. And the next part is the three, A3, uh, which uh, is diagnosed before surgery by imaging or EVUS or media stenoscopy or nodal biopsy. Uh, this is the discrete node and two and the potentially the resectable cases. And the three A4 is the bulky or fixed. And multistation and two is the considered as the mediastinal infiltration and two. And this is usually unresectable cases. So Maybe all of you are following this kind of guidelines. So, it clinically occurred and to, uh, this is usually received the adjuvant chemotherapy and the potentially resective N2 if a single stage. Usually we are doing neoadjuvant therapy followed by surgery, sometimes multistation or the, the unresectable N2 going to definite chemo or chemo radiation therapy. So let's check about the, the clinical occult N2 first. So this is the level uh, uh, category one evidence and is the adjuvant chemotherapy. Usually five year survival gain is about 5%. And the, as you can see this uh, report at the Lancet mm -hmm. 2010, a meta-analysis for 34 trials among the more than 8,000 patients. Five year uh, absolute benefit is uh, 4%, 5%. And the radiation therapy, in radiation is not so beneficial to this population. So occult and to, uh, we don't have any controversies. Usually most surgeons, most doctors are asking for uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. Okay, how about the potentially resectable N2? The surgical multimodality therapy is usually recommended, which means neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Proposed potential benefit is by reduction in tumor size, we can increase resectability and the down, can downstaging media signal implants and the early eradication of the micrometastasis and the in vivo test for chemosensitivity, and the better tolerable uh, than adjuvant chemotherapy. But potential disadvantages can make the increased morbidity or mortality after, during surgery, and sometimes cases ineffective, and even sometimes it can make the disease progression during neoadjuvant period. So meta-analysis usually has benefit for neoadjuvant therapy. The neoadjuvant chemotherapy usually better outcome than surgery alone. And this is also uh, same outcome for overall survival, recurrence free survival, a potential uh, decrease risk of the distant recurrence uh, obtained by neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And, but the 
There is one to radiotherapy, as the role is not so important. So CCRT, uh, you can see in the, this phase three randomized trials, radiotherapy did not add any benefit to induction chemotherapy followed by surgery. So we can uh, compare the outcome of the definitive CCRT versus surgical, uh, surgical multimodality therapy. This is the uh, intergroup 0139, histo histologically proven N2, and the technically resectable case randomized by the, the CCRT uh, followed by surgery, uh, CCRT, and the RT2, 60 degree, 60 gray. So you can see that the CCRT followed surgery combined uh, group showed a better outcome. Of course, the, the, in this group, mortality of pneumonectomy is quite high, but the, when the surgical procedure is a lobectomy, we can gain the good outcome by uh, CCRT or chemotherapy plus surgery than definitive CCRT. So you can see that the role of surgery in this population. So how we can select a surgical candidate? Among N2, this is what, which patient can receive a surgery and which cases are not good for surgical candidate. It's, uh, we can decide by the, the risk factors of recurrence. Uh, to check the oncological risk factors for recurrence is, of course, T stage. Among N2, higher T stage showed the poor outcome. And among N status, non clinical N2 showed the worse poor prognosis than occult N2. And the skin metastasis uh, showed a little better outcome. And the multi station N2 showed the worse poor prognosis than single station. And the multiple zone and the infiltrative bulk N2 showed the worse poor prognosis. Hey, these are the, the as a natural. So the, maybe all of you have agreed with this kind of the, this kind of the oncological risk factor of recurrence. We are uh, reflecting this outcome to our clinical decision. So other papers showed the number of the stations. So these are the, the single, and one single, and one multiple, and two single, and two multiple, multiple and two. So the best outcome is N1 single. And the next is N2 single. This, this group showed a better prognosis than a non-multiple. And these data is all. We have many of the scientific report publications, so we can follow this kind of classification. And also many papers about the number of limb fraud, how many metastasis limb fraud, how many stations had metastasis. So if we go like this, so I think classification will be so complicated. So the, this is just a look at as your reference. So many papers checking the prognosis factors. So uh, you can see that the R1, R2, multi-station, advanced T stage, clinical N2, and the better prognosis showed R0. Earlier T stage, single stage, clinical N0. It is the same result. Uh, by the, the multiple papers. So not only for oncological risk factors, we can check the, the clinical risk factors for poor prognosis, old age, and the high maximal SUV uptake in primary tumors, and the patient uh, received the CCRT uh, rather than surgical multimortality. Surgery only group showed the poor prognosis. And the, when the patient showed the poor response to chemotherapy will show the, the poor prognosis and the incomplete resection and the pneumonectomy will be uh, the poor prognosis. So you can determine the oncological risk factors as well as clinical risk factors. For example, patient uh, uh, lobectomy can be done. You can proceed uh, surgery, but sometimes pneumonectomy is required. You need to 
carefully he evaluate the patient whether you will go to surgery or just a CCRT. This is uh, my hospital experience. Uh, we checked the years of the pathologic N2, 400 cases. Complete resection uh, was done at 92.8%. Uh, Two thirds of the patient received the uh, surgery by bets. Clinical N2 was 40%. So the neoadjuvant band therapy, most of the, uh, among the, the N2Ds, uh, about half of the clinical N2Ds, uh, we received the neoadjuvant band therapy. Which means, uh, I would like to emphasize, this, this is not the uh, all N2Ds. Very highly selected the N2 received direct surgery followed by edge band therapy, which means that only 50% of a patient of end clinical N2 received chemotherapy. So our policy is a single station N2, not uh, capsular invasion. <laughs> These kind of cases, we do surgery first, followed by edge band therapy. But uh, since the lymph node swelling is quite bigger, or some suspicious of N1 or N1 and N2, this kind, we send the neoadjuvant therapy first, followed by surgery. So our risk factor of recurrence is similar as previous report. T staging <coughs> clinical end status is single station and skin metastasis, extra nodal extension showed poor prognosis. So as you know, the, now we are entering the era of the immune checkpoint uh, blocking agent. So this is the phase three randomized double blind placebo controlled multicenter international study for the, the unresectable stage A patient. So the, this immune checkpoint inhibitors and the placebo is showed the much better outcome for immune checkpoint inhibitor group than placebo group. So we are, uh, NCCN guideline is changing like the kind of standard therapy for advanced, locally advanced lung cancer and advanced lung cancer patient immune checkpoint inhibitor is uh, usually standard care of the treatment. <coughs> so the, at this moment, uh, ICB showed a very excellent uh, outcome of the lung cancer. So at this moment, uh, should we discard the surgery in locally advanced lung cancer? So the, our surgical outcome and the surgical invasiveness is uh, changing as well. So with the advance of the surgical technique and the perioperative management, postoperative complication, Mobility mortality is decreasing, and application of the VETS or robotics, minimal invasive surgery is increasing. So surgical invasiveness is decreasing, surgical outcome getting better. So, and then patterns of recurrence. So this is data from Samsung Medical Center. Of course, most of the failure is distant metastasis, but the large of cases still, in many cases, show the local recurrence, which means uh, we have still a uh, role, role in controlling local uh, disease. So even in oligometastasis stage four disease setting, so the local recurrence cases are significant. So we can say the role of local control, role of surgery is still important. So ICB is a kind of a game changer in the lung cancer management. So the, in case, unresectable N2, because the immune checkpoint inhibitor shows a very excellent uh, treatment outcome. So in case, even this group, uh, unresectable cases can be uh, after immune therapy, they, these patients, some patient group can come for cell BG surgery. And the neuroadvanced therapy regimen can be changed from platinum-based chemotherapy to immune. So I think EICB can make a game change in lung cancer management by chemotherapy role, but the, uh, our surgical role can potentially increase. So now we have the report from feasibility and safety of the surgery after immune 
checkpoint inhibitor chemotherapy. Uh, papers from the Memorial Sloan Kettering and the Hopkins. So they showed the series of the uh, surgical experience. So they say the media signal and the highlight dissection is uh, a little challenging because of dense fibrosis. In some case, show the tight dissection, tight adhesion, so required the conversion to the thoracotomy. But even the tight adhesion was were observed during surgery. Still, surgery was feasible. They said uh, uh, surgery can be done uh, not without the very serious complications. So the, this group showed the Memorial Sloan Kettering and John Hopkins experience. They performed the 21 patient uh, after immune therapy, and they showed the, the significant number of the thoracotomy conversion uh, by the due to the tight adhesion. So they tried the 13 cases among 21 performed by tried to by vector robotics, but the, uh, more than half of the patient required the thoracotomy conversion due to tight adhesion. But still, it is resectable. So as a summary, uh, surgery should be considered as part of the multimodality therapy for N2 patients. And the multidisciplinary evaluation is necessary for accurate staging. Accurate staging is very important to, to make a surgical treatment plan. And the careful evaluation about the treatment-related risks risk factors of recurrence, and choose best treatment option for individual patient. And two is very heterogeneous, so we need to evaluate carefully, patient by patient, very carefully. And the decision center, surgeon should be decision center. In my hospital, we are doing the multidisciplinary team for lung cancer and the lung cancer center. So when uh, surgeon says this, is a surgical case. We will do surgery. Our oncologist and pulmonologist has no objection. So the surgeon should be central role in decision. Surgeon knows the surgical risk. So surgeon's opinion is very important in decision making. And the highlight of the response to immunotherapy offers a unique opportunity. Not losing opportunity, but we can get the opportunity for potentially therapeutic beneficial to surgery. And the surgeon should do effort uh, to minimize post-operative complications. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor John. So, uh, so of course, uh, in uh, our country, in Japan, so the, the treatment strategy for the N2 positive patients uh, is very controversial. And so uh, now, the, uh, so I'd like to uh, have a question about the induction therapy uh, using uh, immunocheck blocker in fibula. So, uh, because uh, uh, some patients shows uh, uh, tumor progression. Uh, after the, uh, the, the immuno checkpoint inhibitor, so uh, uh, I am afraid that uh, so the uh, induction, chemo, in the in induction chemotherapy uh, radiation uh, is uh, uh, effective for almost uh, many patients uh, having uh, into disease. So we uh, expect uh, the the tumor reduction for many patients. But uh, in the case of uh, immuno check inhibitor, but, but I don't have uh, experience, so I'm afraid that. Uh, maybe that enhancement of tumor progression uh, may occur. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's true. So we have also same uh, protocol. Our the neoadjuvant setting is uh, as same as previously. In Korea, major hospital, some hospital adopted the uh, neoadjuvant therapy as a chemo cisplatin based chemo and radiation. But my hospital only chemo therapy system cisplatin based. So as you mentioned, the uh, ICB needs more data. So some case more this progression. So we are still uh, investigating. Most Korean hospitals uh, do not accept uh, as neoadjuvant regime as ICB, as same as yours. So some hospital 
some of us has the experience of salvage surgery after ICB. So the, we feel the more adhesions. Of course, that case is advanced case, maybe make more, more adhesion, more, more dense fibrosis, but uh, we have a, a little experience, surgical experience in that case for salvage cases. I think uh, we can have more salvage cases in the near future. So the, because given topic is the risk factor of the, the N2 after surgery, but the, uh, maybe we have the good consensus about a, a kind of the risk case will be uh, in risk of recurrence. I think uh, all of you share the same uh, principle as ours. Yeah. Oh. I tried to get that video, I think oh. it lapsed. So there's a good experience and a bad experience. The bad experience is what, what John said, you have a lot of adhesions. Lymph node dissection is very difficult. But that's your future. Mm. Good morning. Uh, my topic is N2 disease in Singapore. I'm not very sure it should be that way, but I think we all practice kind of the same kind of thing everywhere. So that is my country. Behind all the lights and facade, you will find something like that. So this is an Indian dish. It's my favorite dish. It's called biryani. So my topic is exactly like this. You can pick and choose what you want, but everything is jumbled. So if you miss any component, then the whole dish is spoiled. So an N2 disease is like that for a thoracic surgeon. You have to make difficult choices. You have to make multiple choices. And then at the end of the day, what choice you make affects outcomes. So what are the choices you have to make? So if you look at the screen, you see you have all these choices in a stage 3 lung cancer. And if you are a practicing present-day thoracic surgeon, these are the problems you're going to face. Okay, first question. You went in to operate, you found an N2 lymph node. We will call it incidental N2, yeah? Nobody's going to question you. We went in, we found it, yeah. We also know that the outcomes are pretty good because it's found incidentally. Number two, you go in knowing that there is a lymph node, but you're pretty sure that you can resect it. So that's your second category. So as pointed out in the previous chart, even that has got good, good outcomes. But you cannot say it's potentially resectable because you, as the surgeon, have made a decision to go and resect it. That means you are going in to get it out. That is point number two. Point number three. You think it is potentially resectable, but you're not very sure. So you may leave something behind. So that is your third category. This is where there is no consensus. So you all trust yourself as a surgeon? Yeah, you're going to take it out. But there are certain conditions where you'll find it stuck to the PA, it's stuck somewhere. In expert hands, people will go on to do a pulmonary artery sleeve and all that. You're not that experienced, then what do you do? So those are the three things you need to consider. Now, the other two categories, one is an unresectable end. Calcified node stuck to the main PA, you know that you're not going to get it out without spoiling the whole show. What do you do with that? So these decisions you have to make before you go in. Okay. And there's this category of superior sulcus, which also falls into the category of stage three disease. Yeah? You know that it is potentially resectable, 
but you also find that it is stuck to major important structures which you may don't want to touch during the normal set of operation. Right. The other bad part of the equation is stage 3Bs. Stage 3Bs are radical operations. It can extend from a T40, which has got good outcomes, to a T1 and 3, which has got bad outcomes. How do you make a decision? So that is what my talk is all about. Right. So what is your challenge? You're the surgeon facing. You have a patient with stage 3 right in your clinic. First challenge, it is heterogeneous. It's like my biryani. It's all mixed up. You have to make a decision. So how are you going about it? And what do you understand by the term stage migration? It's a bit complicated topic, stage migration. I'll, I'll put up a paper at the end just to explain it. Sometimes we depend too much on PET CT scan to stage our patients. But we all live in Asia. You should understand that. TB is a confounding factor always, and they can give false positive, PET positive scans. How much do you trust? So there are certain papers from Asia which says that actually there's a false upstaging by PET CT of up to 35%, which is one in three patients who deserved surgery did not get it. So that's the meaning. And brain MRIs, do you do brain MRIs for stage one to two all the time? I don't, because the value you add is not there. For stage three, do you do brain MRIs? Yes, I would do, okay? Because I, we feel it's a systemic disease. The problem with analyzing today's evidence is that all these stage three evidence is from a different era. Now we've moved on. As we just hinted, we already entered the age of immunotherapy. We are not in the zone of pure chemotherapy anymore. So what is the present day stage three which a surgeon confronts in his private or daily practice. And now, you have advances in treatment, you have advanced chemotherapy drugs, we have even entered the topic of TKIs yet. TKIs are now in the adjuvant phase, but you saw the latest breaking news, osmeritinib can become a new adjuvant drug. Once that becomes new adjuvant, you will get different kinds of patients. I've already received patients who are on osmeritinib Patient wants to take a holiday. He's on chemotherapy. Every month is $3,000. Drugs are not free. Surgery is cheaper, trust me. Okay? You operate when the patient is completely downstage. Tell the patient you take a break from osmotinib for the next one to two years, but tell the patient that the cancer is coming back. It's not going away. I'm just giving you a financial holiday. That's all. And that's the reality. It gets even worse with immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is $10,000 a month, yeah? Right. Now, even in stage three, your patient is not the same. There's a patient who smokes. There's a patient who doesn't smoke. Nowadays, we have upward trend of female non-smoking patients with lung cancer. That is the recent trend. And many of them are EGFR positive. So all these things are now coming into the equation in your profile. Concomitant lung disease, smokers, COPD, asthma, TB, bronchitis, all part of your picture. Heart disease, common in Asians. Interinstitutional diversity. That institution will practice, as Prof. Jong said, only pre-op chemo. Some institutions practice pre-op chemo RT. Some will practice pre-op immuno. So it's different. And how do you deal with the scenario? Right, let's go. So the heterogeneity we saw in the things and in the patient. Now what about the pathology? So here also you have a diversity. In a stage three, squamous is treated differently versus an adenome. So if you take a squamous pathology, I think squamous is better treated with multimodality. You operate, have some post-op adjuvant RT on chemo or RT depends on your tumor board decision. The problem with squame, they have good long-term outcomes. But the problem with squame is that there's a high amount of local regional relapse. So your decision making about that resectable N2 becomes very significant in a squamous cell carcinoma than an adenocarcinoma. 
I consider adenocarcinoma a systemic disease, whether you tell me stage one or stage three, it is out in the circulation, believe me. But for squame, it's a bit different. If you have a bulky single station N2 lymph node, your surgery is the most important thing for that patient. You get the primary out, get that bulky lymph node out, get, give RT to that patient, that patient has got good outcomes. So you are a good decision maker for that. What about the non-squame? Multimodality, you may give, yeah, sure. My slide says a little bit worse outcomes than squame because I'm comparing apples and oranges. Now, if you immunot immunotherapy into the equation, things are changing. So it may not necessarily be remaining as worse outcomes. Okay? Right. Also, there is a heterogeneity in type of where the tumor is. So as I told you, if you have a T4, it's still a stage 3. But it is a locally invasive lung cancer. The tumor biology tells you that the systemic spread from this disease is not good. Because even though it's grown bigger, there are no lymph nodes lighting up. So it's a more local problem. So in these kind of cases, you've read patients from Bianchi and everything, they do all kinds of SVC resection, brachial plexus resection and everything. They have still very good outcomes. Their fire survivals are like 63%. That's still a stage three, but an extensive local invasion. So the tumor biology is different. When does the tumor biology become bad? Look at my other side. You can have a T1, but you have an N2 or an N3. That becomes a stage three. Now that is a systemic disease. It's not a local disease anymore. Here, your problem is, what do you do with the little primer you have? So I have a classic patient, two centimeter lesion, one end two. I went in, single station. Histopathology tells me the other two stations are also positive after operation. So when I went in, I was telling the patient, hey look, your five year survival is maybe about. 50 percent, you know, with all the new things. And now when she comes back, I tell her, I'm sorry, it's not so that good. So this is the reality of your practice. What do you tell your patient about how your outcome is, is very important. So you need to have a better understanding of the stage three disease. Okay, where do we start? I think we start here, right? Every stage three must go through an MDT. And you should have an MDT every week or every other week, depending on how many cases you have in your institution. But you should have an MDT. So these are the people who sit in my MDT. Okay? So you start with your pulmonologist. Be good friends with them. They are the guys who refer you cases anyway, right? Okay. And then you have your thoracic medical oncologist. Now, like us, thoracic surgeons who are sitting separate from the cardiac surgeons today, even in medical oncologists, they are starting to split. They have a lot of thoracic medical oncologists. And they should be, because the medical oncology is blowing out like that, laterally. So you should have a dedicated lung oncologist. We are there, thoracic surgeons. You have a radiologist, okay, pathologist. Your pathologist also preferably should be leaning towards lung a little, because you need rows at some point in time. If you are becoming an advanced institution, you want on-site pathology to tell you whether this lymph node has got when you're doing EBUS and stuff like that. So you need to understand the teamwork in this. And then this new category of nuclear medical physicians who read your PET-CT scans, your coordinators, and your rehab and physio personnel. So a surgical team comes as a whole package. No more your single man hero, you're part of a team. And only team gives you good outcome for your patient. Remember, your common enemy is the lung cancer here. So we only have three dedicated centers which do thoracic surgery in our place. Each is what we would call high volume expertise surgical places. This is the problem we have. We do not have a lot of evidence when you compare outcomes of stage one and two versus a stage three. For that, you need thousands and thousands of data, which we don't have in our country. So how do I go about it? So I, I work with other institutions, including STS and Anthing, and I equate my data and see if I collate with them, where do we stand or how do we go about it? And what can you tell your patient? You have to tell your patient something. You cannot tell your patient you're going to survive 10% or 90% without having some data to back you up, which leads to a selection bias. 
you always want your results to be good. You want to good for your patient, but you always think that, mm, maybe I should do this better or not. So you always will have some amount of selection bias. All right, now you're considered surgery. We are all surgeons. So there are three things to do. One, is it potentially resectable? First question you ask yourself. Second, it is potentially resectable, but whether the resection is going to be complete or incomplete. How confident are you? Three, it's not resectable. Let's talk one by one. Okay, upfront surgery. What is your optimal pre-op workup? You all agree, PET CT scan? In the present day and age, you would do, yeah? You need to have a PET CT scan. But remember what I said. In Asia, you have coexisting chronic granulomatous disease. So take your thing with a pinch of salt. You have a young patient, you have a single station lymph node lighting up, don't kill the patient. Don't say you don't deserve surgery. He does deserve because you never know. So we have published a paper which shows 45% of the lymph nodes coexisting with tuberculosis. So you should think of that. Just get a EBUS, get a biopsy, make sure that it is not cancerous, okay? All right, second. Assessment of the mediastinal disease in pet suspicious patients is very important. As I said, you can use many tools nowadays, okay? But please get something. Some people make decisions about lymph nodes based on CT scan alone. If you have a cross-sectional diameter of greater than 1 cm, we know the chance of it being cancer is more than 75%. But I wouldn't play God that way. I would actually go in, get my pulmonologist or myself to go and get a biopsy of that lymph node to make sure it is positive or negative and then proceed on. Brain MRIs, yeah, if the patient is symptomatic or you think it is a high risk patient for uh, spread, I think you should get an MRI. So these three things I would do. Do the PET CE, I would assess the medicinal lymph nodes by invasive biopsy or get a brain MRI. Right, so these things are basic. You know them, you will get them done. Having said that, many of us don't pay attention to this, okay, <laughs> right? You should. Because lung functions are an important outcome and bugbear for a thoracic surgeon. So your decision can even land up between curative, non-curative surgery. This patient can only afford a sleeve resection. So you make a decision. You know that operation will give him a good outcome, but you cannot operate unless and until you do a sleeve. So you have to up your game. So things become a bit more complicated. How are you going to do MIS? You're going to do open. What are you going to offer? So all these things come into play. Yeah? Right. And then, I don't know how much is the comorbidity insect relevant today, but we still have our own, uh, you know, data to fill up, which is what is there. Right. What do we practice? At this point in time, this is the preferred regime for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So it's, it's, it's platinum based, okay, and different combinations with platinum, but basically it's platinum. We do all kinds. I'll come to that, neoadjuvant, adjuvant, concurrent chemo RT, sequential chemo RT, okay, all right, but basically it is all platinum. Now, the categories, how are we going to deal with it? If you find an incidental N2, what you're going to do? You're going to operate, you're already there, so, complete resection. After completion of your resection, finalize pathology, then you will have an adjuvant place, chemotherapy. Why would I consider RT after chemotherapy? I would consider RT after chemotherapy if it is squame, or if it is adeno, but it is station 7. Okay, subcarinals, I always consider chemo RT, because I think station 7 are the sump node for lung cancer. Okay, all right, there's a controversy whether it's 10 or 7, but at this time data is all pointing to a station 7. I think we should consider RT for that. But what if you have an incomplete resection? You, you tried your best and you couldn't. You shouldn't be saying that, but okay, it happens. So I would say you definitely have to go chemo RT. It has to be definitive chemo RT after your operation. All right, potentially resectable disease. Okay, what will you do? So you've decided that you need something before your surgery, okay? So you have three options here. Either chemotherapy before surgery, or you have chemo RT before surgery, or you definitely give definitive chemo RT, where 
the whole tumor board will bitch and say, mm, do, does he really need surgery after this? So decisions you have to make as a surgeon sitting along with your colleagues in a tumor board, you make a decision for this patient right here. Okay? So you think this is potentially resectable, you will tell your colleagues, okay, I just want induction chemo if it is squame or maybe chemo RT. Yeah? But I would agree with Prof. Jong that I would just give induction chemo and carry on with my surgery. It's much better. Right. Uh, what is your induction chemo? We usually use esplatin docetaxel. I think it is the best for downsizing all these tumors. Okay? But don't wait too much for a response. It's usually three cycles. Scan uh, three weeks later. Do surgery within four weeks. Superior sulcus tumors, there's no question about it, okay? There's no, there's no more argument at all about it. So it is induction chemo RT. We use RT of 60, 60,000 grays, which we, we have tried everything, 60, 65, 70. I think for Asian patients, 60 is pretty good, yeah? And you will have very good response, okay? Try and do your surgery within four weeks after the last dose because after that, everything becomes stuck and you can never get into that perineural plane, you'll rip the brachial plexus, yeah? Now, what about unresectable stage three? So now you're sitting in the tumor board, you say, hmm, what do you consider that? Bulky, multistation lymph node, yeah? Stage three P disease, fair enough. And if it's an N3, okay? Right. This paper is quite interesting. So what happens, this is what I said. What appears may not be what is true, okay? Sometimes the PET CT scan nowadays really upstages so much that you will find that the rate of nodal overstaging is as high as 50%, okay? So I would say, remember my first slide. When you made a diagnosis, PET CT followed by invasive diagnosis of that offending lymph node, which you think is stopping you from offering surgery. Okay, that's just the detail of that we'll, we'll have. So, very impressive result by Prof. Jong, which is 60% for a stage three. But well, that's a good cohort of stage three, okay? But if you look at all the data available right now, it's about 35%, I would say. That's where we are for a stage three. For a good stage three A, single station lymph node, peripherally small tumor, I would say 50%. That is what you can tell your patient. This slide is uh, now the hot slide. But this is an effect of the Pacific trial. So the Pacific trial had three branches and they are all completed, okay? Now, there's something called the Pacific trial, the orphan branch, which is the branch where patients got durvalumab and they had a very good response. So now what do you do with this patient? The trial ended, no more money for durva, so what do you do? So they come looking for the surgeon. So now we have a separate arm which has been started and I'm part of the trial. So what do we do is when these patients are downstage, they have stable disease, you go and operate. So we've done 10 and my conversion rate is 20% MIS. Yeah. And being honest with you, and, and, and it's, uh, it's a lot of pain. But I think I found, I did the first case one year ago and after that, patient has not received anything, and no patient so far touch wood has turned up with any recurrence. So where are we going? This is your future, younger, younger surgeons. This is what you're going to face. You're going to get patients with immunotherapy or TKIs. They are going to be downstaged, and they are, your oncologists are going to tell you, can you take this off? Because there's a lot of evidence pointing towards removing the primary bulk of the tumor because that's where your cancer signals come from. By downstaging the cancer signaling point, you're reducing the chance of not only local recurrence, but also systemic recurrence. So that is the key message you need to take. So what do you think? I think these are the aims for you to take back home. First, you should aim at complete resection. But also remember, Stage 3 is can happen in older people. So try and preserve as much as the non-involved lung parenchyma, okay? So don't go and do pneumonectomies if you don't want to, yeah? Try and do lobectomies. 
and try to do sleeve lobectomy so that you can conserve more lung. Patient's quality of life remains. In my opinion, complete resection involves medicinal lymphadenectomy if it's a stage three. Why? Because you need to remove all the lymph nodes, then only you will know what's a recurrence. There's no point going sampling them and then coming off and say, ah, I left one or two loads, is that growing now? You cannot do that. If you're doing a stage three, please take the effort to sit and clear off all the lymph nodes. I think in the present day and age, the mortality should not exceed 3% for a lobectomy and 5% for a pneumonectomy. Okay? Now, immunotherapy is a game changer, and so will be the future TKIs. Okay? Uh, you have a lot of new drugs coming up, especially which inhibit MET, RED, BRAF, and everything, which will actually be changing your life as thoracic surgeons. So you will probably get only patients who had some kind of uh, induction therapy you know, five to ten years from now. That's where science is heading. So your surgery is not going to be easy. And if you want to practice MIS surgery, you really need to be up there sitting with a medical oncologist, making a decision right with them as to when are you going to operate, what is your timing, and stuff like that. Okay? Right. Thank you very much. Questions? Great talk, as always, Dennis. So I have a question about um, when you're going into a tumor board, okay, at, as in Thailand, uh, we don't have our own guideline yet. It's, um, we always follow the NCCN. And as the, the latest have been with the Pacific trial, which the result is very promising for the, the, the N2 disease, how are you going to convince your radiation oncologist and your team that surgery is still um, has a benefit for the patient. Okay. So when I speak to my patients, this is how I tell them, and I tell the same thing to my people on the tumor board. You should remember this. In lung cancer surgery, surgery offers the word cure, whereas chemotherapy and radiotherapy offers the word control. As surgeons, you offer cure. The difference is cure and control. You tell them, you make the choice. I offer you better outcomes because I'm offering you a chance at cure. And the radiation oncologist shouldn't be much in the picture. But convincing your medical oncologist, yes, I agree. But if you can tell him, then I will do a good job getting all the lymph nodes out for you. So next time when you scan, if it is a recurrence, it is a true recurrence, they will start sending you case. Yeah, but the, the problem in my institution is that um, now with the new NCCN guideline, that category one fall into the definite chemo before. Yeah. Now with the devil little map, it's now it's even, the, the benefit is even further. So um, that, that's my obstacle now to, to get the, the end two patient to operate. You will find actually they will start coming to you rather than you going to them because all the patients cannot afford to keep on immunotherapy for that long a period of time, unless you have like super private insurance and all that stuff. It is expensive. So what they will always do, this is, what, this is a good conversation to have with your medical oncologist. When are you comfortable to give the patient a holiday? Because their one month of immunotherapy is actually equal to the cost of your surgery, done and dusted. And the patient gets a one year holiday at least. So there's actually a very good uh, paper on financial toxicity and immunotherapy. Look it up. So it is actually quite toxic. It is quite expensive to some patients, but they don't, and even the medical oncologists don't know when to stop. So once they've started, it's like catching a tiger by the tail. You don't know when to let it go. So if they let it go, they know the cancer is going to come back. So you can tell them, hey, look, I'll give you the time off. Yeah? You, when, the, when, you, when, you, when you feel that the tumor shrunk, PET CT shows the lymph nodes are not hot anymore, send them to me. I will help you out. Thank you. Any of you seeing patients with TKIs and then coming to you for surgery yet? Not yet? You will start very soon. And then that's even worse, William. It's even more stickier. Yeah. But you have some good outcomes. Yeah. 
In Asia, our female population who have lung cancer, close to 65% of them are EGFR positive. Even if they are early stage, we find that the recurrence rate in them is higher. So there is a new theory which is going around to give them TKIs first and then send them for surgery, which is still in discussion mode. So I have a feeling in a few years' time you'll be seeing more patients with TKIs. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I think uh, we'll take a break now. Yeah, is that right? Uh, it'll be lunchtime, and then after lunch uh, we'll meet back here. One p.m. One p.m. All right, we'll meet back here at one p.m. All right. Okay. I see more people than in the morning, so it's good. <laughs>